This is the 40 Thrive Podcast, episode 13. You're listening to the 40 Thrive Podcast, the show created for women 40 and beyond, ready to shake things up. Get exclusive access to expert advice, support, and strategies that will inspire, motivate, and give you the tools to not just survive, but thrive. And now, your host, Jackie McDougal. Welcome to the 40 Thrive Podcast. I'm excited you're here. So you know how sometimes in life we'll meet someone and just click immediately and feel like, how have we not known each other forever? That is what happened when I first spoke to Dr. Sarah Sarkis. Sarah is a Boston-born, Hawaii-living psychotherapist who just has a really candid, approachable way about her. And I have to give a huge shout out to Jennifer Tracy of the MILF podcast for making the introduction because Jennifer had emailed me a little while back and was like, you need to know Dr. Sarah Sarkis. And she was totally right. And I love when women go out of their way to share value and connection with each other. No ego, no protection of I found her first and I'm going to have her on my podcast and no one else can. But she was like, Dr. Sarah has a message and I want to share it with other women who would appreciate it. So thank you, Jennifer. So before we get into the show, I just want to invite you to head on over to 40thrive.com and download my 10 tips to start thriving today. Absolutely free. They are little nuggets that I think even if you do one or two of them will help you to start thriving and maybe get a little bit unstuck. So head on over 40thrive.com to get your 10 tips to start thriving today. Okay, so Dr. Sarah and I chatted for quite a while and I listened to the episode to cut it down to make it a little bit shorter and I have to say, everything she says is so valuable. So this one's a little bit longer than usual, so I'm gonna stop chatting at the top and just get into it. Dr. Sarah is a licensed psychologist, writer, and performance consultant living in Honolulu, Hawaii. She's originally from Boston, like I said, and she has a private practice where she works with adults who are looking to achieve long-term change and growth. In addition to her psychology training, she's studied extensively the use of mindfulness, functional medicine, hormones, and how food, medicine, and mood are all interconnected. Dr. Sarah is a badass 40 Thriver who you just need to know. So let's get into it. Sarah, welcome to the 40 Thrive Podcast. Thanks. I'm thrilled to be here. I read your bio before you came on. The thing that catches me, I have to read this over and over again. My style is eclectic and blends psychoanalytic theory, positive psychology, existential psychology, neurobiology, and functional medicine to bring a truly integrated approach to your quest for a sense of wellness. I emphasize collaboration, partnership, and personal empowerment. From a layman over here, you sound badass, woman. Thank you. I was thinking to myself, Jesus, you must lose millions of people must click off when they read that nonsense. (laughs) No, because I think that there are so many things in there that I'm like, okay, tell me what makes you different from somebody who's going to look for a therapist and try to work with someone in private practice. What I think now, I'm 44, so we're like basically the same age. Let's Um, go with that. Exactly. What I have learned as I've matured in the chair, as I call it, is that a therapist, you know, once you're getting at the doctoral level of training, everybody's gotten a pretty rigorous academic training, right? Unless somebody comes in really looking to distinguish themselves with a particular style, like a lot of times with trauma, you can find people who specialize in like EMDR, or they specialize in these very specific forms for very specific groups. But I'm a generalist, right? So really, when you come, the greatest asset a therapist has is their personality, their character, and how they work within the relationship that you're going to develop therapeutically. So really separate from all that stuff is I think what separates me from anybody else is that I'm me and there's only one me. Right. (laughs) And so everybody else has their own me that's equally and totally different, but great. And you just have to jive with really the core chemistry that who I am as a woman 
and a therapist will bring to the mix because that's the one thing I can't change. And that's what I tell every patient that sits down with me for the first appointment. I'm like, you're auditioning me. I'm not auditioning you. You just have to feel like there's good chemistry because I can't be anybody but who I am. Otherwise, this won't work. So that's why I would say what distinguishes me is that, you know, I'm my own person and I bring this unique fingerprint to what I do professionally, even though my diverse training helps, but that's really only a byproduct of that's the way that I am, right? I'm somebody who likes to integrate lots of concepts. I'm not somebody who likes to stay within one modality. What's interesting is I've spoken to many women over 40 through the 40 Thrive community who see a therapist or are potentially seeking out a therapist or maybe one for the kids or what, whatever it is. And that's fascinating to me that you, first and foremost, it's all about who you are as a person and your personality. Because mm-hmm. people think, at least from experience, people I've spoken to, they think like, oh, well, that person's a therapist, so they must fit the suit. You know, <laughs> they have to, I make these bra- crazy Brady Bunch references that no one ever gets. Oh but like- oh, I, I know this reference. I, now I, I loved you when we first, the Johnny Bravo. Cause yes, it's so exactly. Yes, I love it. So, you know, but they think, oh, we'll just go find a therapist. It doesn't really matter. And then there's this whole like therapy doesn't work for me because they didn't find the right therapist. That's like going out and marrying just a random person and saying, oh, marriage didn't work for me. The first one you landed in the office with, by the way, most of us tested out a couple spouses in the form of dating, right? Right. Can you imagine if you just like landed in the first, and what I always try to say to people, because I think that being a therapist for me, it's a privilege. So I always say to people, listen, the worst case scenario, we're going to model together that you have to advocate for yourself in your health care. The days of just walking in and thinking I have the answers for you or any physician of any kind does are over. They are long over in the rear view mirror. Mm-hmm. And if this doesn't work for you, there's no ego involved. Just tell me and I will now make you a personal referral so that you're not looking on the internet or trying to, you know, find some other means. And I think that's my responsibility to tell people that. Because they're in a very vulnerable, nobody comes to me because they're happy. Like literally nobody (laughs) calls me to tell me I'm killing it in life. So they're right off the bat, they are vulnerable. Right. And I want to level the playing field. So they start to, right from the get-go of communicating with me, they start to realize, oh, I have choices. Yeah. I'm participating in this. And the fact that you are able to really empower them to make the choices and not just kind of, I've been through therapy. You know, I had an amazing therapist in the 90s and I feel like I would not be where I am today without her. Um, But I know that there are some who will just kind of keep the same clients year after year after year without getting to that next level to Uh getting to that place where they're where they're feeling responsible for their own actions, where they feel empowered to make new choices. I mean, do you see that a lot where people kind of come in trying to sort of feel better about where they are and understand where they are, but not necessarily are ready to move forward in a positive way? You know, what I see both in the mirror and in the chair is that most people want to feel better. They really do. And universally, it like I always ask, once we have the first appointment, and usually I tell people by the end of the second appointment, you should have a really clear sense of if you think you can work with me. And if you can't, I'll make you a referral. If you can, we'll sort of begin in earnest, right? Because you Mm -hmm. don't want to dump your heart out to somebody that you're you may not work with, right? Right. So you kind of in earnest get going. And I always ask people this same question. If therapy went 100% according to your plan, what would you want to get from it? So I basically ask that because I'm trying to see how close are our therapeutic views, which I can sort of sum up for you if it makes sense. But 
how close are our, our views of what therapy are. And I've now realized 15 or 20 years in that there's like no end to how different our views are. Most people come in and they just have this feeling that they want to feel better. You know, it's a big task to take on <laughs> given that life doesn't always feel good. And so I always spend some period of time trying to help people see that for me, the goal of working together is that you feel that you can manage and self-regulate and experience all of your feelings, not just happiness. Because then happiness just becomes another cage that you're either nailing it or failing at it. Mm. So I just want people to develop this emotional flexibility and that they feel that they can greet whatever life comes at them with, with a new set of emotional and psychological tools. Sometimes those are behavioral as well, you know, but most of the time it's real internal work. Um, And so what I find universally, and this is true for myself just as a human, is that people struggle. They, They just, they have periods of time in their life where they are struggling. There's a handful of diagnoses that I feel are really important, like because they really shape how you work a treatment. And those are very sort of significant, quote, mental illnesses. But the vast majority of what comes through my office isn't pathologic, in fact. It's a normal reaction to life's stuff. I mean, it's, you know, you're not supposed to feel good after you get divorced or a parent dies or a child leaves for college or you're going through menopause or you are having waning sense of passion in your marriage or these are periods of time where struggle is just baked into the equation. Right. So yeah, I do see a lot of people coming in with struggle, but also my audience is skewed. But for the most part, I come across very few people where I'm seriously worried about their mental health. I may have tremendous empathy for where they're at, but very few people that I'm like, oh, wow, like this person is unwell from a psychological standpoint. And then I'm sure you have a a totally different course of action if that's the case. Yes, exactly. It really does take treatment in a different direction completely. But the vast majority of people, what you're feeling and experiencing, even when you're struggling, even when it's acute anxiety or whatever the feelings are, it's not actually pathologic. When you unravel the tape a little bit further, they're having very normal reactions to difficult times in their life. You know, we spoke a couple of weeks ago and you were telling me that a good percentage of your clients or your patients are women over 40. And so when you talk about these challenges, that they're going through. Do you find that it's actually the challenge that is kind of knocking them on their butt for a little bit? Or is it sometimes the expectation that they're not supposed to be reacting the way they are to the challenge? Yeah, that's such a good distinction. I don't think that I've ever even thought of it that way. So that's just awesome. It's for sure the latter. I mean, there's always, a you know, as a like woman of science, I sort of try to be moderate in my always and nevers. For sure, there's the other version. But yeah, a lot of times you see that the biggest critic is inside. And once you learn ways, first of all, you have to understand why you have that critic. And then you have to do the arduous work of undoing a really bad habit. And it's arduous. Uh, Trust me, I'm littered with bad habits. And it's an endless effort to sort of rework our neural pathways around that. Um, And then usually, you know, it takes care of itself. Like you realize like, oh, I'm just doing the best I can. And like I can choose to beat myself up over it or I can choose to just sort of be in this moment. Now, that's a long process, the getting to the choice, feeling like it's a choice. But once you, once you have partnership where you're deeply observing your own process and really taking sort of radical accountability for how you operate inside of you, it's pretty amazing how quickly people make changes and make shifts. That's amazing because I can count, <laughs> I don't think I have enough hands to count the number of times where I hear 
somebody, in, including myself, who say, oh, this is happening. I can't believe I reacted this way. Or, oh, my memory's not the way it was when I was 25. And what's wrong with me? And, mm-hmm. you know, and it's like this, I'm going to beat myself up over some of these things that, by the way, happen naturally and happen to most people. Uh-huh. But for some reason, our expectation of ourselves, oh my gosh, I lost my temper. What's wrong with me? As opposed to like, oh, hey, I, was I lost my temper. You know, right. <laughs> that really ticked me off. I probably could have done that better. But whoa, that's, you know, it, it, it's done. So I find it so interesting when, and again, it's not just the people I talk to, it's myself as well, the expectations. So where do you think that comes from when here's a challenge in front of me and maybe I didn't react to it or maybe I am comparing myself to my much younger version or whatever it is, but that self-talk that kind of, we beat ourselves up where we would never do that to a friend. Or a child. Right. Yeah. I mean, that gets into this discussion to get back to the description of what I integrate into my practice. So for me, and lots of different therapists would have different vantage points on this, but for me, I really see our patterns as, and and I like to dwell in the realm of our unconscious patterns. So usually like whatever anybody comes in wanting to talk about, the only reason I ask why, you know, what brings you now, which is one of my intake questions is because I'm trying to get a sense of basically what are they telling me they're willing to talk about right now? And what are they telling me they're, that, that they're aware of, like what's on their emotional sight line. But I already know that everything that's driving it is unconscious. It's just the way we work. Almost over 90% of what's happening for us lies in the unconscious. So Mm -hmm. essentially what I believe we end up seeing in our adulthood and the 40s, I have to tell you that the, the, from 40 forward, the people that I see make the most radical, empowering choices and changes in their life are 40 and older, men and women in very different ways. And women have such a beauty to that I love when I realize, oh, this is a good vibe with a woman who's in her 40s, 50s, or 60s, even 70s. Um, I love the back nine. Back nine is fascinating. (laughs) There's so much wisdom from these women. So to answer your question from the tangent is that the behaviors that we see and the patterns that we see are is this complex series of neurobiological wiring. So I would think of it as wiring, but it's really sort of... If you think about when a baby is born to when you're, let's say, 40, okay, Mm -hmm. that you're having an uncountable number of interactions in your life that are both active, you are experiencing it and then reacting in the moment, but also the ones that you just watch and see, like when we see our parents interacting and behaving. And a lot of times what we uncover once we're doing this kind of work is that a lot of why people do the things that ultimately sabotage their own sense of wellness is because it's unconscious and they saw it in one way or another. They saw it happening. It's these layers of neurobiological patterns of attachment that happen. And once we can really draw observation to it, you know, that's the first step. It's like, that's like the biggest step is making it from being just this unconscious pattern of like, I don't know why I do that to, oh, I understand why I do that now. I I see why I do that. Um, And I always tell people to have this prompt that, that they can find their own. But like when I'm trying to change a deeply held pattern like that, I just start to try to observe it in myself. Like, and I literally will say to myself inside my own head, uh, oh, I'm doing that again. There's that point of injury because it's an injury. Mm. It's a soft spot. So that's why you haven't looked at it. That's why you haven't unpacked it. It's why it holds so much power over us. And so I just try to say, oh, look, I'm doing that again. I, there's that soft spot or there's that injury point. So, you know, maybe that's helpful for people as, if they're, if anybody's listening and thinking, oh, this kind of work could be really rewarding. Right. Which I think it is. I would highly encourage it for anybody. And that's not just for job security. I would think it was cool (laughs) if I wasn't 
trying to run a career. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you can only take so many patients anyway. So it's not like you're trying to get everyone to show up in Hawaii, which is, by the way, where you are. I know. Although, you know what? If I if I go back to therapy, I think it's going to be with you in Hawaii. (laughs) See, (laughs) it It has a ring to it. It's just the right thing to do. It is. Really, it is. (laughs) If you're looking for an integrated approach where the weather should be, you know, beautiful all the time. Exactly. I mean, yeah. come on. I can't really complain too much about California, but Hawaii is definitely especially uh, a, where we a came step from. up. Oh, for sure. Massachusetts, where you're shoveling till the end of March, you know. I know. It toughened us up, though, right? Don't you think the best thing you did for your relationship with Massachusetts was to move? <laughs> well, yes, actually, that's, that's a, uh, a great point. I always say I couldn't you know, it's funny that we're talking because this week, this is the week where I have been in California for 24 years and I was 23 when I left. And so I've actually been out here in LA longer. You've passed the line. I've passed the line. It's such an awkward thing to even think about, but Massachusetts is my foundation. It's like my core, unless you've grown up on the East coast in new England and you know, you can't really understand what that means. Of course you can. Yes. Um, But there's a lot of respect I have for that area. There's a lot of my grit I've gotten from growing up there. 100%. And and I think even when I moved to California in 1995, I noticed a work ethic that other 23-year-olds did not have. Oh, yeah. So it was, it's really- East Coast school is not for the faint of heart. (laughs) No, it is not. (laughs) It's like the school of hard knocks, right? Yeah. (laughs) But I, I'm grateful for all of that. I mean, with that, though, there's definitely some programming that we all, you know, when we get away from where we kind of were born and raised, we start to see patterns in ourselves that we get just from upbringing. And it's not like pointing the finger at anybody or anything, but just, you know, we, we grew up in a different time. We grew up in the 70s and 80s. So how we show up in the world today is very different from maybe how we were taught to show up. Yes, for so sure. There, yes. that's that's an interesting, you know. And push I pull. always say too, like, because you know, there's always a there's always an awkward intersection with introspective any process of introspection because you are looking at the way you were raised, right? So a lot of times parents and other caregivers sort of come into the frame to look at it. And I always say to people, listen, this isn't personal. It's just, we have to look at it because sapiens are pack animals. And Mm. so your family, your culture, your, if you have a religion, all the sources of community or a pack that helped shape you are present in your neurobiological patterns. And so we got to take a peek under the hood, girlfriend. Like, we, <laughs> we, you know, we, we have to lift it up and really sort of look at it if we want to be able to make conscious choices around how we want to author the next chapter. Well, what's interesting to me is how you talk about women over 40, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, even 70s, and how they approach therapy and personal development in a way that is different from maybe they what they would have done, you know, when they were younger. And so do you think if I look back for well, a couple things, if I look back in my 20s at some of my habits and going through therapy and looking at my upbringing, there was a lot of blame. There was a lot of finger pointing. There was a lot of I'm this way because of you, you know. And then in my 30s, it was like I was busy having my own kids and kind of busy and all that. And there wasn't a lot of personal development happening. And then, you know, you hit your 40s and you've got a little bit of time to come up for air and you start to look back and it's an amazing place to say, yes, this is my behavior probably stemmed from this, this and this. But not looking at it as no more finger pointing, no more blame, no more I'm screwed up because of you. Now it's like, oh, I understand what makes me tick due to these circumstances in my life. But it is my time to take control of my life and really make choices that benefit myself, my family, my friends, my community now. Yes. And so do you find that with those patients that are coming in that they're just, they give less fucks, <laughs> let's be honest. Like that's-, that's my favorite phrase. That is like <laughs> my, like giving zero fucks, hashtag zero fucks is my favorite phrase right now. And you couldn't have summarized the decades 
better. Like, just go write that in a book. You have a bestseller. <laughs> I don't even need a cut from it for the My four page bestseller. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. 20s have righteousness. I love oh, working yeah. with 20 year olds. And in the 20s, I love that. I love every decade. We but knew the, everything in our 20s, didn't we? By the way, it got you out of your adolescence. So have, have gratitude for it, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, thinking I knew everything got me to get a master's, a doctorate, and really steer this vessel away from the icebergs that are your early 20s, right? Like anything that can get you in your 20s, you're unrooted, you can barely support yourself, but you have enough freedom to be dangerous. It's like, good (laughs) golly. I mean, so- I can't believe we survived it. And thanks God there was no social media. Oh my God, it's true. This is my next thing. I want to talk about how at some point- how mothers can help children navigate social media, but that's a side tangent. So you're totally right about the 20s, mm-hmm. completely 100%. And by the way, I wouldn't have got through Georgetown, my college, if texting or social media existed. I would have failed out. I would have been one of those people. So thank God it didn't exist. I bet a lot of us would could, would fall under that category. Completely. So 20s are that way. 30s, same exactly. I find the same thing when you said there's not a lot of space for personal improvement. The way I sort of see it is for a lot of women in your 30s, you're sort of head down building your legacy, you know, your legacy, your, your family, or if you're not having children, you're building other elements of your career in earnest. And for me and for you, like I was having a family and building a career. So Mm -hmm. there's just not a lot of space for that kind of self-reflection unless you're really in therapy, right? And yeah, and then the 40s arrive and now being four years in myself, I just think they're very liberating. They're just that, that, that's the way I experience them. And I also experience it as this sense of like, I have such a clear sense of that I, if I w- want to do this, this can be anything. The, the listener can fill in whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Bike across Europe, date a young guy, date an old guy, leave your guy for a woman, whatever your gig <laughs> is, right? Like start a company, retire, whatever this is. But if you want this to happen, you have to do it and you're capable of it. So that's the experience that I have, that women starting somewhere in their 40s, this different set of drives kicks in. And I really like it. And also women in their 40s, your lens, your brain is complex enough to be nuanced. But the reason in your 20s you don't have nuance is because you're righteous. You mm-hmm. can't be righteous and nuanced at the same time. It's always one or the other. And in your 40s, you're so nuanced, right? Like you so see the sense of radical accountability is available. And that's always, it turns the finger from pointing outward to just looking inward, right? Like, okay, so what can I do? given right. everything that's happened. And so blame does recede to the background. And once you can move past blame, you can really start to see choices that aren't present when the brain is wired to look at blame. Blame is myopic and empowerment is, is a wide lens, super wide, right? It's panoramic because you're seeing a lot of choices. They're just very different brain chemistries. I can only imagine how much better it gets with your clients in their 50s and 60s and and by 70. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's like, I mean, I I feel like we I almost feel like it's not work. Like I have to tell you, like I have a a handful of clients right now, women who are in their mid to late 60s. And it almost feels like sometimes in my head, I'm thinking to myself, am I getting more from this than they are? (laughs) (laughs) That's amazing. I want to like pull out yarn and knit with them all day. I was going to say, like, do you like mall walk on yes. your, <laughs> I can just picture you in your little white sneakers walking totally. around the mall with your little butt shaking. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like it is just so rewarding and it doesn't mean there's, there's always struggle. So, you know, I and mean, we can't escape it. It's just, can you greet it with some sense of wisdom and grace? But it's so amazing that, the things we get so hung up on that can really 
overwhelm us and dictate our lives because it's this huge deal. And then as we kind of strip ourselves from the years, <laughs> then we kind of see, we see things more clearly and with such a different perspective. Can you imagine? I, I even think about this like when I was going through potty training with my kids, right? Mm -hmm. And oh, it's, uh, you know, it's the worst thing in the whole world. And, you know, you see, I have sisters and brothers with older kids because I'm the youngest. Well, I'm the 11th of 13 and you're the youngest of six. I know. I know. <laughs> so you we get were this. At birth. It's true. We really were. Yeah. <laughs> but they, they were both like too many kids. Yeah. Split these we're two up. divide and conquer. <laughs> but I, you know, I would see my siblings going through teenage stuff and, and things like that and looking at me like, oh my gosh, you know, this is really not a big deal. How are you so wound up? And the only thing you can, only thing that changes your perspective is time away from it, right? Mm. Mm -hmm. and it's time just, and maturity. Yeah. And so I really feel strongly that to not look at life right now as if it's so hard and this and that and the other thing. And then 10, 15 years from now, I look back wishing I had appreciated it more. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's a good question. I mean, listen, so the, the statistics on, let's just call it kind of like adolescent angst, and we're going to take adolescence from, let's say like 15 through, you know, your mid twenties, right. Or as you near 30. So is that how long the angst lasts? Well, think about how <laughs> asking for a friend. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, think about like it changes. So the early adolescence is different, but like then there's all this angst in the twenties. At least from my experience mm. as a woman, I didn't see it as much in men in their twenties. Um, they seem to sort of solidly rock bachelorhood, like with, for the most part. I mean, of course, there's internal musings, but there's really centered a lot around career. For a lot of women in the 20s, it's sort of career and it's relationship. There's like this strong feeling of like, am I going to partner so there's just a lot of angst, but I will say this, that, and I have a 10 year old or 10 and a half year old, and I can sort of see this preteen angsty kind of normal narcissistic lens of like everything so uniquely torturous for me. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, let me get my tiny violin. <laughs> itsy bitsy violin. But the truth is, I think the brain has to go through periods of that. But I do think there, the brain has to go through periods of struggle. So I don't think we can eradicate it. But I will say that what you're sort of, this undercurrent to something you're saying that is true, which is that I think for a lot of, of us in our 40s who are starting to head into the stretch of time with our children, like where the intensity turns up, they kind of become sexual creatures, which is normal. They have more freedom. They start to experiment. School gets harder. All these social groups, all these things are happening that it does feel more slippery and dangerous than it did for maybe our parents. Like our parents had different worries with us, mm -hmm. but it feels like the world we're launching our children into has, it's like higher stakes or something. And the it numbers- feels like it. Yeah. And the numbers support it. So we're not just crazy and neurotic about that. The numbers really support it. You know, age of onset of, you know, mental illness, quote unquote, that would include any kind of anxiety disorder, et cetera, et cetera, is earlier. And, you know, I mean, adolescent suicide is on the rise and uh, it's still not the highest. Actually, the highest is middle-aged white men. Really? Um, Yes, surprisingly, or not surprisingly to me. But um, so, yeah, I mean, listen, it's, I think some of these periods of time of struggle, they aren't pathologic either. They're sort of, and I say to my son sometimes, like, I know it feels like this is everything. And like, that's just how your brain works right now. You just have to trust me. It's not. But you know, you try to support that. And then by the time, like, I look back at the things that worried me in my 20s, and I just think to myself, like, wow, like, if I had just known it was all going to turn out this way, <laughs> right? I would have had a 22 through 27 that is like a total rewrite. Like, if we think of it as a script, very mm -hmm. little would be kept in, other than the career part of it. Right, right. Like I'm glad because I went and got my doctorate. I'm glad I was like super self-righteous in knowing that I wanted to be a shrink, right? Like you're 22. How could you possibly know that? But sure. 
pick something. Well, you did it. You know? I did. But do I you did. think that you would rewrite it because of the concern that you weren't going to get where you wanted to be? I wouldn't necessarily change any of the experiences, but if I could have changed how I orbited around those experiences, I would have saved myself a lot of angst. But that's, again, that's what I'm saying. I think that struggle is built into that chapter and that if we found a way to erase that part of your 20s we would change who we are in our 40s so maybe i've now talked myself out of changing any of it <laughs> well know? exactly and and what you just did though is a such a great representation of what we do in our 40s so exactly. i was talking to somebody recently and she was making a, a really i thought a really strong point and then she stopped herself and she goes, hold on, I have a better idea than the one I was just expressing. And I started laughing because that's so us. So like we work through our thoughts sometimes in conversation. We are talking to somebody and then we kind of set, step back like you're watching yourself from above and you go, you know what? That's not necessarily how I do feel. Let me fix that. And we have the wherewithal to say, no, that's actually wrong. <laughs> I yeah, want to have, start again. Yeah, we have cognitive flexibility. That's again, so righteousness, which is a developmental thing that's present in every person I've ever worked with in their 20s, even masculine, feminine, all of it. Because righteousness doesn't have that kind of brain achievement yet. So you're totally right. You're totally right. Yeah, I probably just like working with women older than 40 because, quite frankly, they self correct better. It's less right. work. Yeah. There because, really is this capacity to self-correct. And it's amazing. And it's so freeing. It feels like handcuffs have been pulled off. So I have a 12-year-old daughter who I made a point to her uh, about a week ago. I had said, you know, this is what I'm seeing when this happens. Do you agree with, with my assessment of the situation? And she stopped and she gave it like a good 20 seconds. And she said, yeah, yeah, I don't. I don't feel like myself when I'm around that person and I don't think I'm the best version of me. And I was like, holy Drop shit balls. Like this girl is 12. If I were 12, when I was 12, I would have been like, no, no, I'm not. I'm exactly the same. No, no, you're, you're uh -huh. not telling me. Like I would dig my heels in so far. They'd be touching China. You know, it was totally, it was like, you know, we'd be yeah. become so indignant, but I don't know. Maybe it's because we are, so willing to self-correct and admit when we're wrong and really just try to be a better version of myself today than I was yesterday, that somehow it's rubbing off on our kids. I'm not really sure. Okay. So what you're saying, first of all, that's like such a beautiful moment that you could refer. I think you did a lot of things right in that scenario. One was you basically hit it out of the park in terms of <laughs> the sort of like cautious way you have to approach teens and preteens. Oh, yeah. Like, you know, it's like you have to say, <laughs> is their hair going to catch on fire if I say this out loud? Right. And then just like tiptoe away like it didn't happen if that does happen. <laughs> but um, you caught her in a receptive moment and you really, you got the ball on the sweet spot. So uh, I think you did a lot right. It's also just a beautiful testimony to probably equality. You will see in your daughter's character expression increasingly as she matures. And I wouldn't expect you to see consistent returns on that until mm. she was 25 if she's an old soul and 30 if she's like just kind of here for the first time. Right. So that's just beautiful and a testimony to her. And it will be like, you know, seeing a unicorn. Like you may not see it till she's 16 again. <laughs> I but tell my kids that they're, when they're teen, you know, I have, I have three kids, 14, 13, and 12. Wow. And I tell them that the teen brain, and this is not science. I am not a woman of science. You are. <laughs> but I do tell them that their brain is actually created to screw up and make mistakes and bad decisions in their teens. Yes. And that, you know, we just have to hopefully give them enough guidance that the, the decisions that they make won't be long lasting. Yes. So when it comes to drugs, when it comes to sex, like we need to have conversations regularly Yes. that can kind of guide them in the right direction. But you know what? They're going to lie. They're going to yes. uh, say they're going to one place and they're going to be another place or whatever yes. it is. So I'm, I'm working to try to be not that 
Massachusetts strict oh. mom, <laughs> you know, oh. but it doesn't always work. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. you know, I feel like even just telling them like, oh, this might happen before it actually happens. Then when they start to see signs of it, they don't feel like freaks. Yeah, exactly. Totally. And I also think so one of the things that you said before that I want to make sure I say out loud is that when you said like also her seeing you behave that way, you were and you sort of were being funny, but like you're like, hopefully somehow it rubs off. It does. Mm. That's what neurobiology is. So our brain and our mind is housed inside of that. And then our body, those three things, body, brain, and mind, they are constantly absorbing what they're seeing, wordless, hearing, through language, feeling, through emotion and touch. All of our senses are in an integrated process of taking our world in. So when you hit it out of the park, like in that scenario, also your advice to your teenage uh, or teens and preteens is perfect. The brain is designed to make mistakes. That's how it learns. But when you model to them a grand slam like that, of course it impacts them. You're modeling the 40, what did you say you're 47? Mm -hmm. you're, you're modeling some version. She's She's going to have her own set of stuff that's all her. And oh, then yeah. she's going to have the influences of modeling and genetics. So environment, that's modeling, genetics. And then she gets a whole chunk of that pie that's just all hers. She gets to author it. And when she's 47, she's going to represent that hybrid. And those experiences with her are going to shape that woman. They are shaping her right now. So it definitely makes a difference. It definitely, if, by the way, if every time we screw up and we think to myself, like I'll think to myself, like today's the day, like this is the day, X marks history right here where like you just screwed your kid up past all <laughs> repair, right? Like, this is the one. <laughs> document it because you're going to wonder later Brace where yourself. it all went wrong. <laughs> it was today. If those days matter, so do the Grand Slams. Mm, what a great way to look at it. And, you know, again, to go back to that brain that we have, you know, it's so nice because we don't acknowledge when we're doing things right. We just acknowledge that we screwed up. And yes. so to think about that, I mean, yeah, I screw up, but I also, I try really hard to take accountability for it. You yeah. know, same, same child came home a couple of weeks ago and I was still in work mode and she was in after school mode and wanted to get her homework done. And I wasn't ready to like provide that, that support. And so I kind of lost my, I was frustrated. I was like, can you just, you know, give me a second. But instead of saying, hold on, I need to finish my work mode and then I need to transition into that or whatever. I could have co communicated better. And so later I said, you know, I'm really sorry. I just wasn't in that space and I should have communicated that. And she said, no, you know what? I also know that you're working. Like, I don't know who she, oh, I, mean, I love her. She's yeah. She, I, I, I want to be here when I grow up, but yeah, she, too. um, she said, I, I know you were in that space and what I need to do is wait for you to receive. And so I have this thing with my husband because you know, you're married, right? Yeah. <laughs> so just because we have something to say, doesn't mean that our significant other spouses are ready to receive. Mm. We're not always in that place. And so if he's maybe working on his computer or just came home or whatever it is, I came up with the system a long time ago that I've actually even used in the office environment when I'm working on TV shows, where I will ask him, like, are you in a position to receive me? It, he either says, you know, what, I need five minutes, or he actually like gets himself ready. Yeah. And I love it's, that. It's so My husband would make some sexual innuendo, but um, <laughs> well, I, we may, I, I, I can't say that that's never happened. Yeah, but that's happy too. Maybe that's what had to happen. Maybe your message was you know, um, loud and clear. But, but yeah, so my my husband is a, also from Massachusetts, so you oh. can imagine what I'm oh talking about when I say he'll have something inappropriate to say. Yes. Um. So I love that. I'm probably likely going to steal that. <laughs> I'm glad because I was working on a show and a few years back, and you know, it's myself, an editor, an associate producer, and we we all work in in one room. And so we're doing our independent work, but then we have to collaborate. And I just, 
it makes me crazy when someone comes up and they just start talking and they just expect that you are in a place, especially mm-hmm. we've got a lot of ADHD in this family, you know, so mm-hmm. it's, it's, we're not always in that space. And then it becomes frustrating. It becomes really difficult to communicate. And so I literally have these two coworkers who still to this day joke with me, like, are you ready to receive me? But I, I think it's changed. It's completely changed my life. And mm-hmm. for my daughter to say, I didn't ask you if you were in a place to receive, I was like, holy crap. Like, my work is done. Yeah. My work <laughs> is done. Exactly. So like, <laughs> my work is done. Yeah. I love it because actually, as I'm like taking in what you're saying, you're really talking about this notion of um, having boundaries and boundaries are about self-regulation and that's just two major, major regulatory processes that are so important. And when we see disturbances in boundaries and disturbances in self-regulation, which every human being has at birth up to a certain age, and every human has some element of self-regulation that has glitches for them, right? For you, like for me, it sounds like you and I are similar. Like I'm sort of scrappy and have a lot of moxie. So mine is like patience and I can sometimes Mm. just be like snippy, like to my kid, right? And it's like, I really have to work on that. Like don't... Girlfriend, don't be like that. Like he's ten, right? right? So, um, but everybody's got their own little spot where self-regulation gets little glitches. But remember that we're born feral, so we're like, and I'm saying feral on purpose. It's also, I think, a funny way to think about us. <laughs> but I mean it because I want when Tell I'm me. Wor- when what do you I'm mean wor- by it? Yeah. So when I'm working with people, I want them to not just give lip service to the reality that we are animals but to truly embrace that. Like we're not a special breed, we're animals. Mm -hmm. And our brain evolved over, you know, millions of years to have a complexity that you see now with the cerebral cortex and all the stuff we're capable of as humans. But we are feral animals when we are born. We are not born domesticated and all mammals have to learn regulation from their pack. And in in our species, it's a family because we don't like birth our children, lick the placenta off and send them out into the world. We have a very long period of time where our juveniles, our juvenile animals Mm -hmm. are dependent on us. And that arc is, you know, roughly 18 years in the sense of most of us or earlier, if you, you know, send them off to boarding school, they leave your pack, but they're still heavily regulated by another system, right? So in my house, we all went to school and then went to college. College was the first time we were leaving the house. So that's the first time that I was truly on my own to regulate myself, find my own boundaries. And that's where you really get to see something that, that that sentence, are you ready to receive me? And your daughter echoing that word receive, you really get to see it's in college. You're going to start to see her doing that spontaneously and without having to think about it, because that's the first time she's going to be completely on her own in that sense, right? Right, right. So I think that is such a good metaphor for how we learn internal boundaries, right? Like I am not ready for this. And how do we expect our children, let's take your daughter, for example, how do we expect her to say other things that she's not ready to receive? Right. If she can't even regulate just who comes in and interrupts her concentration. It's interesting because when you think she's 12, but if you think about women in their 40s, 50s, beyond that, when we don't have clear boundaries... I know. You know, that's when we find ourselves, and I'm not talking about the the medical diagnoses. I'm not talking about, you know, but we we feel more pulled in all these different directions. We feel more anxious. We feel more angry. We feel because we haven't created these boundaries to really protect ourselves. To know what is and is not okay. And just the ability to say no no, I'm not ready to receive you, right? Like no is a complete scent. Why? Because no. Right. right. Because no. Because I said no. (laughs) That's why. Yeah. Um, I mean, you got to give me a time because we're talking about it. But if you need 15 minutes to eat your snack, then let's do that, you know? Yeah. 
Exactly. So it's true. And I think that one of the things that the experience I have of being a woman in my 40s, but also when I work with women at 40 and older, is that oftentimes that this is a period of time in your life where you're willing to re- reauthor boundaries, right? Like when your children were really little, you were willing to sacrifice more time or more energy into other things, right? And then they get older and you start to have this space. You're like, oh, I can reauthor these boundaries again. And that is what truly I think is what is such a joy about these chapters of our life is that you really can author a reinvention tour. Like people do, I, I know for sure I will do my best work ever in the decade that is unfolding now. I know that. Like I can feel inside myself that my best is for sure yet to come because of where I am in my life and how my, my what my brain is primed to do in these decades. And yes, the memory is a little bit more cottage cheesy, but there's <laughs> ways around that. And what, what are some ways around that actually? Well, there's a ton you can do for your memory, right? But there's also now like so many tech things you can do. Right. To, like, so most of us will notice that our, our memory for like to-do lists gets worse, right? Like if it's not written down, it sort of isn't happening, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. So there's a ton of things you can do in that regard, but also like long-term project. This is, you're just catching me in the chapter where I'm obsessed with this intervention. So now you're going to be subject to it. And any patient that, yeah, any patient that's listening is like, I know what she's going to say. Buckle up. (laughs) Get in a sauna, not a steam room, a sauna, dry heat. I know. It's not what you thought, right? (laughs) Wait, seriously? Dead serious. So get in a sauna. Go, and I can add for your um, show notes, the woman that I would go to, Dr. Rhonda Patrick, she's got the best synopsis of all the research around this if there's people that just want to geek out on the research. This is true for men and women. But women, get in the sauna. Can I go to Vegas instead? It's similar. Yeah, totally. Exactly. (laughs) So the therapeutic dose is 174 more than 20 minutes, but you can work up to that. And, And some sauna is better than no sauna, but I'm a science geek. So I always want to give people the actual recipe. Definitely link to all that because that's fascinating. Is that supposed to help for your memory? Brain, memory, basically all the critical elements of what people call cognitive decline as you mature. That means you can't remember shit and you (laughs) feel like your brain is a sieve all of the cognitive decline. So I combine like some breath work and a little bit of meditation Mm -hmm. in there. So you're killing like three birds with one stone. And I live in a building with a sauna. So I know that it's easy for me and it's not easy for everybody else. But if you have a gym and you have a sauna, two days a week was the minimum that I think they studied in these Mm -hmm. studies in the sauna. And it's, it's great. And then, you know, there's tons you can do just like remove diet soda, try to eat just like food. Try to just do right. like six, just six months where you just eat food and it's close to its original form. You know, the Michael Pollan, like eat mostly plants, not too much. Right. Mm-hmm. So just sort of simple things can help a lot. Get sleep. Guard your sleep like it's a blood sport. I don't think enough women understand that. I don't that. think enough people understand the power and the importance of sleep. Uh, anybody who is listening who has worked with me currently or in the past must be laughing hysterically because I have emotionally waterboarded them (laughs) with the necessity of sleep to the point that they're like, I get it. Like I bought in and I'll, I promise you I'll chip away at my sleep. It's so important. It is just, it's critical. And there's, there's even when we talk about like when we get down to the, this is all the stuff I do in my, in my work, right? So when we get down that you're always, you can do macro level, people can start to understand their neurobiological processes, especially the unconscious ones. And then we can get into real sort of micro, right? And the micro is how do we break this big thing of change down to chunks, cognitive chunks that the brain can handle? Because we know about or I know, about the science of um, habit formation, right? Mm-hmm. So even when I say to you, get more sleep, if we're working together, that's too big. 
it's too, the brain actually looks at that. And the first instinct is like, what? Like, huh? Like, and they, it's not like, oh yeah, let me tackle this and deconstruct how I could get more sleep. It's too big for it. So then we break it down even further. What can you do to get more sleep? First thing I would do is make sure every device in your room is on airplane mode. Mm -hmm. Your alarm clock will still work even if it's on your device, right? So we break it down. And I don't know if your audience wants to hear like every micro breakdown, but when you're trying to make changes that will change how your brain functions, you want to take it in the smallest increment that's doable. You want to think to yourself, am I able to get my forefinger to press the airplane button tonight? Yes, I can do that. Okay. <laughs> right? That's how simple you want it to be. And then then we build from there. We take it in tiny, tiny doses. It's like microdosing for change. Right. I love that. Yeah, because you know, it's super I'm, doable. I'm very much an all or nothing kind of gal. And so it's like, oh, I'm gonna sleep. I'm going to bed at four in the afternoon. I'll get up at four, you know, like, I mean, it, I just go over the top and then it doesn't happen and all that. But sleep is actually one of those things that is a priority for me. I go to yeah. bed at a reasonable time. I used to stay up and try to get more and more and more done. And then I'm not productive during the day, you know? Totally. And so uh, I personally use uh, on my iPhone, there's a, the option of just turning off the notifications. Mm-hmm. So between and you 11- also don't want the Wi-Fi around you if you can. Oh, because that's mm-hmm. going to mess with my sleep. Well, I mean, you know, I'm no like EMF or electro, yeah, ele- EMF. I'm no EMF expert, but there's mm-hmm. sort of enough people that I think toe the line between too radical for my taste and too conventional for my taste. I mm-hmm. like a bit of a maverick. I don't mind somebody that's going a little rogue, but like I don't want to then like follow the doomsday preppers into Middle Earth, right? There's compelling people con- continuously sort of looking at this notion of like the Wi-Fi waves constantly around us just interfere with the rhythms of our sleep. Mm. So if you can get your Wi-Fi off, that's great. But if not, canceling notification is better than nothing. You just don't want to hear the drum beat of like, as every email arrives in your inbox or every text message. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, ton, I can't sleep, sleep with that. Sleep is just, it, it's, you know, when I talk about being an in, wanting to work from an integrative method, it's, it's really not complicated. It's stuff like this. Like, what are you eating? How much sleep are you getting? Do you move your body? Do you drink enough water? Do you have support in your community? Then with just those, I always say to my patients, like, there's these five things you can do. And it's basically that right there. And like whenever people, you know, and then the therapeutic relationship does a lot for like trauma, self-regulation, boundaries, connection. It does a lot, right? Like I think I'm valuable to people and I'm Mm -hmm. grateful to be in that position, but honest to God, you can do so much without me. I'm, I'm optional. So basically Um, lifestyle changes are really, I mean, it is the answer to everything. Mm-hmm. It is it's the certainly answer. a start. Yes. And I'm yeah. not saying if, you, if you've been diagnosed with a, you know, an illness or whatever it is that, you know, just change your lifestyle, but eating healthy whole foods, moving your body, getting sleep, not only will it make you your, your body happier, but you're absolutely right. Like, I love that you brought it back to that because it's not as complicated as we like to make it. There's so many people medicated and you know, automatically go to that space again before you start emailing me. Like medication is extremely necessary. I would never judge. There's There are so many cases where people are absolutely, and I have had times in my life where I've been on medication. And at that time in my life, it was 100% necessary. Mm-hmm. But I think said. that these lifestyle changes also, whether it's in conjunction with medication or on its own as a first step, as you're saying, is so powerful. And, and we can't stress it enough, in my opinion. I agree. And going back to when I was saying, like, you know, my style is just integrative, right? Like, I'm somebody who likes to tie in 
a lot of different thoughts because I have so many of them, right? So like, I'm just trying to funnel them into something that's coherent for people. So again, for me, when we talk about doing it in conjunction with, to me, it's always in conjunction. Somebody can come and see me and they can be on medications, be it psychiatric or otherwise for pre-existing conditions. And we can do all of this stuff and nothing is wasted. It's always an inside job. First of all, it begins and ends with your own relationship with yourself. And that's what it's all about is how are you going to take this vessel? And part of this vessel is your own relationship to it psychologically, physically, how are you going to author the days, which are unknown, you get on this earth? And so to me, it's always an integrative thing. It's always yes and. Now, there's cases, and you're totally right, and I I really appreciate the space. I, I was on another podcast a few weeks ago where I had the same space. And you're right. Like my instinct whenever I write anything on my blog is I always want to write like, I know the nuances of the world of psychology. I live in the trenches of the human condition day. Like after I get off this podcast, I'm going to see six people. Right. And I'm like, please don't email me. Like I'm just saying it for saying sake, but it is always really important. I think anytime you're working where you have a voice that people listen to that we do say, you know, there are some mental illnesses that just require medication. As far as I can tell right now, now when I'm 65 and science has advanced and my own curiosities have taken me new places, maybe I'll have a different opinion of that. But at 44, people struggle with real stuff that may need medication. And there's people for whom they owe their life to that medication. And so we don't want to knock it. And I know you're not coming from that lens either. I can tell. No, not at all. And I knew from our previous conversation when we caught up like a couple of months ago that I know that you hold real respect and reverence for it. Here's a statistic that I just think people should think about. In the U.S., we are five, the U.S. population is 5% of the world population and we consume 66% of all the psychopharmaceuticals produced in the world. Wow. That statistic seems excessive to me. And I'm somebody who sat for the greater part of two decades in the trenches with people and in the trenches of my own existence. And even me as somebody who, you know, I have patients who wouldn't have survived without it. I'm saying 60, like I feel like as a national project, I think we can carve a couple of percentages off of that and get us at the 50 yard line. If we start to really talk to our patients and and help our patients advocate for even the simple lifestyle changes that they can make, that, you know, those are the people we're, we're never going to, for the, for the people for whom they are struggling with a serious, serious psychiatric condition, we may never get them off of medication. And in that case, let's be glad we have it. But for the vast majority of people who don't actually need it, if they get the support that they do need, like the way I work with patients and the way other people work with patients, then I think we can easily get 66% down to something slightly more reasonable. You said something earlier that I want to go back to because you talked about sleep and you talked about food and you talked about moving, but you talked about the support sort of um, in community, in your family. And I think that we tend to underestimate the power of connection. So I work from home. I do the podcast from home. I'm around so when I can go get my kids or, um, or at least I'm here when they get home. And so I know I love being around for them and all that, but I don't have any sort of connection throughout the day, you know, unless I'm out with clients and that's totally different. But I do a lot of work on my own in my own space. And I know that if my husband comes home on Friday night and we don't really leave the house by Sunday night, I am losing my mind. Yeah, you're a cage animal. Yes. And I can't even take it. And so I think that we are so independent and isolated in 
you know, entrepreneurship's amazing, but there are a lot of people who are in their own spaces and they're not connecting in their community. They're not connecting in their family. I think that's why sometimes it's so powerful to have some of these online communities because at least there's like a little bit of, mm-hmm. you know, oh, someone someone actually told me that I don't suck today. That's how, that feels really good. Mm-hmm. But I think there's something to be said for creating that commitment to seeing other people and connecting with other people throughout your week because it can be really isolating and really lonely. Uh, when you're not doing that. And I, and then how easy is it to call a doctor and say, I'm feeling depressed. Yeah. I think I need medication. Yeah, it's very easy. But outside. Yeah, you know? and you're just, you know, you're just in that case, you just sort of, usually they won't call a doctor and say, I think I need medication, but they'll call a doctor and say, you know, I don't feel good and I'm blah, 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 right? And they might leave with a prescription for which they wouldn't necessarily need if you got support. But yeah, community is huge. And like, if you read any of those books on the blue zones, there's the one called the blue zones, Mm -hmm. um, which is great. I'm drawing a blank on the author, but I'll um, add it to the show notes. Definitely. And I'll send you the link too. So the really interesting thing is, yeah, they talk about like the food that they have there. And there's lots of elements to these blue zones. Blue zones are where people are routinely living to a hundred or older. Mm. One of the elements is deep roots, deep roots in community. And it is so important. It's just, it's critical. Loneliness is a killer chronic loneliness, normal episodes of lonely. And I've had lonely periods of time in my life or life where I felt periods where I felt more or less connected to my husband. Like, you know, after my mom died, because grief is often solitary, I felt more disconnected. But the loneliness of just that you feel as though you literally have no human connections that's a killer. And so community is root, a sense of roots and community is routinely on the top 10 list of things that lead to longevity. Right up there with sleep, (laughs) diet, (laughs) movement is a sense of community. It's critical. And this is coming from somebody who, while born into a litter, my nature is very lone wolfy. Mm. I, you know, have my private practice, but then I spend long hours in my house where I am right now, um, writing and researching stuff. And, um, you know, I'm somebody who can isolate myself. I can withdraw easily and just sort of slip between time and be like, oh, it's been weeks since I've done anything social. And I'm telling you, it's really important. So, you know, it must be really important because I'm introverted and a lone wolf. And, Mm -hmm. um, it's super important. It is really critical. That's why we turn so much to our partnerships for that sense of connection, because that's wired into our animal going back to that we are just animals. We're not actually like a special anointed population of animals. We're just animals in an animal kingdom. We are pack animals. It's deeply wired into us. Absolutely. And I think that's why this time, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, beyond, as long as you're still alive, it's time to really figure out what kind of makes you tick and what makes you happy and whether you want to go and take a dance class at the gym or ceramics or knitting, you know, or mall walking. I love that when I see, you know, a a group of elderly women doing some sort of activity together, you know? I do too. And I love when I see friends that have traveled as a little vampire, like, you know, they, they, (laughs) they're doing their mommy weekends away when the kids, and then like to see them mature into their fifties and sixties, still doing that and see how the trips change over the, I just love it. Totally. And sometimes these are people that aren't necessarily, they don't fit in your day-to-day life. Like maybe you're not, I've, I've had friendships. I mean, we know this, like throughout the years, they, they morph and they change. And I love those friendships where you've, completely done separate things and you've you're not necessarily in the day to day but then you get back together and it's like no time has passed. Those are some of the most meaningful connections I have period. You know, it's like we don't even live in the same place but when we connect up it's just like a you know, it's a shot of emotional fuel right to the heart. You just feel so good. 
Absolutely. Now, and if you can, you know, go on a trip with some girlfriends and make sure that you eat really, you know, eat well and move your body and get some good sleep, then you'll have all the things. Yeah, I was just going to say, and by the way, if you get that going, sign me up. That's like my, I I aged into like, for me, getting into my 40s, where everybody seems to be sort of becoming more civilized. It's like, they're just catching up to me. I was the 24 year old who was like leaving the bar at 10 at 10 p.m. being like, nah, I don't want to be hung over tomorrow. I, I want to go for a good run and get up early. And, and people are like, okay, goodbye. And like, yeah, so we now would not have been is- in our 20s. <laughs> See, that's why we're meeting right now. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I'm like, I'm your gal for that trip. Awesome. <laughs> You're making up for lost time. I am. I fit right in now with my peers. Right. Because the rest of us now are like, oh, I don't want to feel that bad in the morning. So you were just, you know, you were an early bloomer. That's all. Yeah. But I really. That's a very good reframe. See, now if that was yourself, (laughs) you'd be like, I was lame. I was blah, blah, blah. But that was a great reframe. You're right. Um, I was, I was early. I was early to the party. Yes, you just appreciated, I think that you appreciated your life and how you felt like you actually had boundaries that you created at a young age. So you would feel your best. Yeah, that wasn't how my 24 year old brain metabolized it going back to our earlier discussion of I think that that struggle Mm. is just built into the developmental stage, right. But now I can have fond appreciation for the fact that, you know, I didn't I, I, I was I was yeah. not debaucherous at all in my 20s. I'm just going to leave it at that. That's a great, <laughs> sounds like a perfect way to end. <laughs> so I just appreciate not only your, and I, I say this to all my expert friends on the show, that you don't just show up with your education and your science and then just like spew out a bunch of facts. And you really put your own personal experience, your heart, your soul into what you do. And I think that's the stuff. That's the stuff that makes you special. You know, I know you say it's your personality or, and, and, and absolutely. But I think that you come from this human side, this side where it's like, hey, we're all in this together and we're all struggling and I'm not here to judge you or to be better than you. But I'm just here because I know a few things and I can guide you. That's like the best compliment ever. We can even take out that I know a few things. It's more like, yes, like we can just figure this out together. But that's so nice because I do hope that I convey uh, an authenticity to what I'm doing. So you're, another new feature of being 40 is that I'm weepy at everything. <laughs> everything makes me feel nostalgic and weepy. So that makes me feel happy, sad. Oh, but yes. you know, I just really appreciate you. And I have to ask you because I ask all my guests. Yes. Um, and I'm going to put you on the spot because that's my favorite part of the job. Good. Is What does it mean to you to 40 thrive? It's a great question. Okay. So 40 thrive for me means to really do to make good on the fact that I really just don't care anymore what anybody thinks about me. Mm. So I want to take that, you know, I don't want to go out and be an internet troll then, but I want to, I want to say what I want to say. And if you don't like it, okay. I hope it made you think. And if you do, you know, like (laughs) sign up for my newsletter and read my blog. (laughs) Um, but I really do. I feel like I, I feel a very liberated from caring anymore about what anybody thinks of me. It's freeing, isn't it? It's very, very, very freeing. And I'm telling you, I, I can, I know that, and I know this for most of the women that I've worked with that, you know, this is the start of, if you're just getting in your forties, if not like postcard from the future, hats off to you. Don't ever convince yourself like, oh, I'm middle-aged. It's too late. It's not. This is literally the perfect time to do and say and move your life in the direction that you think will be authentic for this chapter. And I feel that really deeply inside me right now as a, as a 44 year old woman, I feel like, you know what, like, I'm just going to do this. Screw it. Awesome. Game on. Game on. Well, so how would our listeners 
uh, reach out to you and also sign up for your newsletter? Yeah, so they can go to my website, which is Dr. Dr. and Sarah Sarkis.com, and th- that you'll see. And my website, too, it's about to have a facelift. Oh. So they can go there, they can sign up, and I'll, you know, I'm doing some stuff down the road, like a canyon ranch over the summer that people can look into. I'm doing it with a really fun friend of mine that you would jive with a lot also in Boston. And then my telephone number and everything is there. Like if anybody is in Hawaii and wants to see me, but also I'm in a training now. So I'll be increasingly available for um, online work and telework because I'm doing a training that's going to allow me to work outside the confines of my psych license, which confines me to work in the state that I live in, or I have to get licensed in every state the patients are in. Oh. Yeah, so it's a real limitation. So I'm getting this optimal performance coaching certification to be able to work outside the confines of that. And then also I do like corporate work. So people can contact me in that regard as well. Well, that's fantastic. DrSarahSarkis.com. I will add that to the show notes so people can just click right on over. Perfect. And I really appreciate you. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. This was a blast. Don't forget to subscribe to the show wherever you love listening to podcasts on your favorite app. And if you're not necessarily an app person and you are listening to this more on your computer or using a link, you can get all of the podcasts at 40thrive.com slash podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Take care and keep thriving. Keep thriving.